All right, in this section, we are going to talk about graphs of basic functions. So we're going to talk about just some basic functions that I want you to be able to recognize. Um, right now, I'm not so concerned that you can graph them. However, having an idea about what these graphs look like and you can go from there. I would really say um, some of them we're going to spend a little bit more time in later on in the course. However, being able to identify, recognize will just help you when you further your math career. You'll just be able to see that and it'll be a lot easier for you. Um, but before we jump into that, that's just a little teaser for you. Before we jump into that, we're actually going to talk about continuity. Okay, when you think of continuity, it's exactly what you think it is. It's something that can be drawn without picking up your pencil. So if a graph is continuous, it does not have any jumps. It does not have any holes. Nothing in your graph that could stop you from continuing your drawing. So as long as it is continuous, it is exactly what it is. Um, now, whenever you look at graphs, you are going to determine something called an interval of continuity. This is the same kind of concept that when we did increasing, decreasing, and constant. Whenever you have an interval of continuity, really any interval that you talk about, you're always referring to the domain. So you're always looking for your x values whenever you're looking at intervals of continuity. For intervals of continuity. Good. Let's try some. Okay, I've got a couple of examples here, and literally, I took a picture of your textbook to do some problems out of it. So let's take a look at part A here. If I want to find the interval of continuity for this problem, if you're looking at this, and we're going to learn here in just a second, is called a quadratic, so it's a U. Are there any breaks in that? Nope. Are there any holes in that graph in part A here? Nope. So my interval of continuity, I'm going to shorten it to be IOC, interval of continuity is going to go from negative infinity to positive infinity. Awesome. Because remember, it is your x values and you look at your arrows. Even though this isn't increasing very fast, it will continue to increase as well as the left will continue to increase. Awesome. Let's look at part B. Ooh, what do you see in part B? Yes, right. You got a nice big hole in your graph right there. So your interval of continuity, remember, goes with your x values. So your arrow to the right goes on forever. Your arrow to the left goes on forever. So really, my concern is right here at the hole, and I just need to jump over that. So I have everything from the left, so negative infinity, all the way up to 3, but with 3, do I use a parenthesis or a bracket? That's right, parenthesis, because parenthesis means up to but not including. So I'm going to union, pick it back up at 3 again, and head that on into infinity. So really, I'm just jumping over 3. Everything else from negative infinity, that's a negative sign, from negative infinity to positive infinity is totally legit. The big question is, what makes my domain, what puts a hole, what puts a jump, any of that stuff, and that's what you have to go over. Good job. Okay, as you notice, all I did was take a picture of your textbook again so that we can talk about this. Now let's talk about some basic functions. If we're looking at this problem, an identity function is just a line. Remember, f of x, whenever we're talking about uh, notation here is the same thing as y. So this is the same thing as y equals x. So it's just a line that goes through the origin with a slope of 1. So whatever y is, x is. So, so that means your domain is from, oopsie daisy, your domain is from negative infinity to positive infinity, and so is your range. So we're in good shape there. Cool. All right, so let's check out another one. Okay, now notice your book calls this one the squaring function, but as you can see, I've kind of crossed that out. This is actually called a quadratic. I'm not really sure why they call it a squaring function in this section, and then whenever we get into, we're actually going to look more into this in section 3.1. We'll do more graphing of quadratics, etc. So for now, we just want to identify if it looks like a U, 
That's a quadratic function, which the graph of a quadratic is called a parabola. So if you've heard of a parabola, that's what this is. It's just a quadratic function. Now notice your domain is from negative infinity to positive infinity here, but your range just goes from zero to infinity because that's your minimum value. And then it just goes up from there. Because honestly, if you square a number, so I have this squaring function, if you square a number, it's positive, right? So it can't go down below. Good. If you're following along in your book, I'm skipping around on you a little bit here with this one. The square root function. Now remember, the last one we just looked at was the square ring function, which is actually the quadratic. And maybe they call it the squaring function because now you can take the square root of x instead of square it. So it's that opposite that you're looking at. Now remember, whenever we had our two big fat no-nos as far as our domain was concerned, you could not have a negative under an even root. That is this situation here. So notice, because you cannot have a negative under the even root, your graph starts at 0, 0. You can't have a domain that's a negative number, and you cannot have a range that's going to be a negative number. So you start here at 0, 0, and then you go from there. So remember with the quadratic, I'm just going to put a little dashed line here. It went up like this. So basically, we're taking our quadratic graph, and we're pushing it over. We're pushing it to the right, and so then the top of your quadratic graph is how you get the square root function. So there are relationships there when you're looking back through these different functions, and that's always a good thing to pay attention to whenever you have these as well. Awesome, let's do more. This one's called a cubing function. Now with a cubing function, um, it's also just called a polynomial. Your polynomial function in this instance um, just has an exponent of 3. So that's what makes this a cubing function. In section 3.4, we're going to be graphing polynomials. So it'll be more than just something that's cubed, so we are going to get into that a little bit more. However, pay attention to this, the fact that I have an odd exponent here. My domain is from negative to positive infinity, and so is my range. We were restricted whenever it was squared with our quadratic, but now that it's cubed, it's a free-for-all. Whoop, whoop. So that's awesome. Okay, so check this out. I have my, uh, pardon me, my cube function just kind of lines up like that with my arrows. So it's going to go on to infinity, but notice how fast it grows, how steep that top part and the bottom part are. Pretty cool. All right, let's do more. That's right, you guessed it. If we can have a cubing function, la 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 la, we can also have a cube root function. How cool is that? But also remember, it's an odd root. That's why when we had our big fat no-nos in our domain, we specifically talked about an even root because an odd root, you can totally take the cube root of a negative number such as negative eight, what's that? Two, right, you got this. So if I'm looking at my cube root function, notice how that relates to my cubing function. I'm basically just going to take it and spin it around. So if I have my cubing function that goes up something like this, basically you're just spinning it in order to get there. Pretty sweet, right? Yeah, it is. These are called inverse functions which is actually kind of cool, and there's a little teaser for you. In chapter four, we get to talk about inverse functions, so that should make you happy. Just know that it's on the make. Cool, but same concept. We have an odd exponent, an odd root, so we're negative to positive infinity. Cool. The last, but certainly not the least, that we're going to talk about is the absolute value function. Now, whenever we were working with absolute value previously, you looked at your absolute value, and that was the distance from zero. So remember the guts of your absolute value? Whatever always had to equal a positive number, and that's how we come up with this V. 
So that's why your absolute value is a V, because whatever you put in for X, you can have negative numbers that you put in for X or positive numbers, but it'll always end up on the Y value with positive. And that is why your range goes from zero to infinity, but your domain can be anything. Because you can plug anything inside your absolute value, but you always have to spit out a positive number. So it's basically like the identity function, except you can't have negative. It kicks it up to make it positive. Cool.